All right, guys, today a quick review of the civilization of the Americas here. Try and get this done quickly for you. And the early inhabitants of the Americas are going to cross the Bering Strait, the land bridge running from Siberia and Russia to what is um, today Alaska. And the early Paleolithic nomads came over here following herds of game for food. Um, as they do this, they will gradually expand and settle North and South America. But as the Ice Age comes to an end and the ice melts, the cultures of the Americas are going to be separated. They will be vastly different from the ancient river valley civilizations of Egypt, Mesopotamia, India, and China, because they are cut off from cultural diffusion. So they start over here, migrate over, then it takes thousands of years to inhabit North America and make it all the way south down into Tierra del Fuego. But some of the cave paintings that you see in the American Southwest are very similar to those that we'll, we will see in, in Asia. So we know that this migration happened and there are similarities. After the Bering Strait is going to melt, as I said, the Mesoamerican civilizations are going to start to form villages between 5000 and 2500 BC. This is well after Neolithic farming began in Africa and Asia. They're about 5,000 years behind already. And so this is how the Americas are going to exist um, until the Spanish arrive. The Mesoamerican communities will begin massive city building. Um, you know, the eight factors of civilization in 1500 B.C. Everyone else had already started that practice about 3,000 years ago. And these separate cultures are going to be that way, remain that way, for the next 3,000 years until the Spanish arrive. So, summing it up, the American civilizations will do the same things as, as Africa and Asia and even Europe. It's just going to take them a little longer because they have no access to cultural diffusion. They have no help, nobody there to give them a blueprint or an idea. This is evidenced by Mesoamerica never developing the wheel because they did not have large beasts of burden. No horses, no oxen, no donkeys. Everything had to be done by pure human labor. And the Olmecs of Mexico, the coastline of Mexico, are the foundational empire in Mesoamerica, just like Ghana was in Africa. Very easy to remember, the Olmecs were from Mexico, because the Olmecs are from Old Mexico. There we go, history, world history joke of the day. And they will develop between 1500 and 4000 BC. So think of ancient Myce Mycenae, the Trojan War, and the heyday of ancient Greece. And they had several um, large cities, the two biggest being San Lorenzo and La Venta. Um, for whatever reason, San Lorenzo was the big city at one time, and then it slowly declined in power, La Venta rose. The analogy I use is the old Rust Belt cities of Chicago or Cleveland and Detroit, people leaving them and moving to places like Charlotte and Atlanta. The Olmecs do have elaborate drainage canals where they formed large basins of waters with elevated spillways to constantly keep their water revolving in a circuit circle to, to be fresh. So they had drinking water and irrigation water. And we see the first evidence of pyramidal architecture in the Olmec Kingdom with the 110 foot tall Pyramid of the Sun. Now while it's only a quarter of the size of the Great Pyramid of, of Giza, and a 10-11 story building is no joke. And we know that the ancient Olmecs were run by priest kings, people who understood the forces of nature, people that um, could observe you know, when to plant, when to harvest. Um, they could study the, the seasons and the stars 
And so they become God kings, just like the other early River Valley civilizations where the same thing happened. And we see the first evidence of the part jaguar, part human god that will be throughout Mesoamerica. So instead of the Egyptian half human, half lion, we have a half human, half jaguar. Another um, similarity. After this, we get the standalone city of Monte Alban, which is in Mexico, just inland from the Olmecs. And Monte Alban begins to grow right around 500 BC, right about the time Rome is beginning to, to be formed. And the people of Monte Alban are the first in Mesoamerica to use prisoners of war for some type of human sacrifice. Human sacrifice and bloodletting, a key part of Mesoamerican culture. And when things were bad, because they believed their blood was worth more, the Mesoamerican elites would sacrifice themselves because they felt their blood was more important than a prisoner of war or an average everyday Joe. And Monte Alban is important because they have two calendars, a solar calendar and a lunar calendar, two interlocking rings, kind of forming a figure eight or the infinity symbol. And this is one to the sun, one to the moon, and it is the calendar that everybody is going to use until Spanish conquest. And Monte Alban will collapse in the heart of the European Dark Ages, and just inland from them, very close to modern-day Mexico City, is the city-state of Teotihuacan. And it is powerful from around Pax Romana until the heart of the Dark Ages, like Charles Martel defeating the Muslims. And from looking at Teotihuacan, we understand that they had a strong central government. Somebody to say, this is what we're going to do and how we are going to do it. And that's demonstrated by the city layout. The city is a giant grid pattern with roads running perfectly north and south and east and west. It empties out onto a giant plaza where you have the governmental buildings on one side and the religious buildings on the other. And with two great pyramids, the Pyramid of the Sun and the Pyramid of the Moon. What else we know about that is going into the city, there's the three mile long avenue of the dead where there are spooky faces of monkeys and jaguars and snakes. And their job is to scare off the mean evil spirits. And buried in the wall were impressive nobles and high priests. So you look at the avenue of the dead, the grid pattern, the large buildings, we know that the people had a strong central authority. Someone had to say to get this done. They had to be highly organized. The building teams, the building materials, we got to have this stuff done now. And they had a knowledge of complex mathematics, exactly like the ancient Egyptians in the pyramids, Mesopotamian ziggurats, Harappa and Mohenjo-Daro in ancient India. We know all of this based on their city layout. Now, we know they controlled trade routes. And what was interesting about them is foreigners could come into Teotihuacan, but they were segregated to a separate market. They were not allowed all the way into the city. And as the city expanded, they saw that they were kicking their own farmers out of the farmland, and so they stopped and said, this isn't going, you know, we're going to run out of our own farmland. So they began to build smaller satellite miniatures of Teotihuacan throughout the region, spreading their influence, just like Augustus Caesar had to make the world Rome policy, building those small Roman villages throughout Europe. Here in Teotihuacan, the people were deeply polytheistic. Um, they also practiced ritual sacrifice. And for whatever reason, we're not really sure, the people disappeared right around 700. We know there was a big fire, but that the civilization rebuilt itself, but it never was able to achieve the height that it once held. And that gives way to one of the big three signature 
civilizations in Mesoamerica, the ancient Mayas. And the Mayas lived on the Yucatan Peninsula. Down here, if you think of Mexico as like an arm flexing, it's like the fist. A popular resort spot like Cozumel for um, you know, cruise ships. And the Mayas live in this you know, humid, jungly atmosphere. And they're located on the Yucatan Peninsula that has big mountains and thick jungle making up part of the modern-day um, countries of Mexico, Belize, Honduras, Guatemala. And they have a couple big cities we're going to um, talk about here. So here's where the Olmecs were. All right, here is Monte Alban, Teotihuacan. This green area is where the Olmecs are. And each city-state is going to feature giant pyramids. There'll be 39 or 40 giant city-states. And they all have carvings on their temples and palaces. Um, and so we would really like to be know what they wrote. But unlike Nicolas Cage in National Treasure 2, we're not able to translate a lot of their writings just yet. Each of these cities were ruled by god kings of single family dynasties. So while the cities fought each other, like the ancient Greek city-states, the kingship of every city, Tikal, Polonique, was never usurped. One family stayed in power the entire history of the Mayan civilization. 39 cities, 39 different family dynasties that were never overthrown. And we know that these cities were linked by trade, and they sometimes uh, um, were allies with each other for trade or for warfare, and sometimes they were enemies, just like ancient Greece. Um, and some of the important crops that they are going to cultivate will be corn and beans, rich high in protein that you can prepare many different ways so you um, never eat the same thing twice. And, Interestingly enough, they used cocoa beans as currency for a while. Well, in one of the larger cities, kind of growing over by the jungle, we have the large pyramid in Tikal, 212 feet high, roughly half the size of the Great Pyramid. But you can see it is not as wide as the Great Pyramid. It's narrower and much steeper as you were led up here to the sacrificial chamber. Here you go up into the ziggurat-shaped Polonique. As you went up the stairs, the sacrificial victim was strapped down to this stone. And when they were executed, they let the blood kind of filter through these inscriptions. And then it tilted and drained the blood deep in land, watering and placating the gods. Here is Chichen Itza, where you can see if you look from Tikal to Polonique, to Chichen Itza. It's a bigger pyramid, and the stones are more smooth, like an, like an Egyptian pyramid, and it is by far and away the biggest. And in Chichen Itza, you will see one of the other things that makes Mesoamerica famous, the ritualistic ball game. It's part rugby, part soccer, part basketball, where you've got to get a ball, a rubber ball, through this hoop, 15 to 20 feet up on this wall, and there were no rules. Um, the high priest sat on one side, the king sat on the other. They could communicate by whispering into these satellite dishes, like the ones I told you guys about at the um, uh, Durham Museum of, of Life and Science. And during the big festival, if you won, you were sacrificed so you could go assist the hero twins to go combat the forces of evil. One twin was resurrected as the sun, the other one was the star Venus. Other times, if you lost, well, you were a scrub and you would be sacrificed. So you had to know when you had to win or lose the old ritualistic um, ball game. Uh, Mayan religion was extremely complex. It affected all parts of their daily life. Um, it, you know, their, their political life, their social life, um, it governed everything. Sort of in a way like the Islamic um, Sharia. There was a total integration of church and state. 
So part of the Mayan culture, they are run by a theocracy. When it comes to technology, they were some of the first in the world to understand the concept of zero, and it allows them to work with, with complex numbers. And what helps us is their calendar started with a fixed point in the past. Let's say it's their creation. And they kind of divided it out. And so when the Europeans will arrive, when the Spanish will arrive, they're able to look at the Mayan calendar we call the long count, and it allows the Europeans to match what was happening in Europe with what was going on in Mexico. Charlemagne has crowned the Holy Roman Emperor, the Treaty of Verdun, the signing of the Magna Carta. Um, we know all of this, and we can match it with, with what was going on with the um, Mayas. Um, once again, they had 39 Greek-like city-states that were run by single dynasties, and two of these governments were even run by women. Um, the social class is always the same king or the high priest, the royal family, and the advisors, nobles, merchants, and artisans, and down below are the commoners. And since they didn't have metal outside of gold and silver and a little bit of copper, their weapons and tools were made of flint or that obsidian, that big rock that I showed you guys that was extremely, extremely sharp. This is what you would use diff different colors for your tools and for your um, fighting items. Um, the Mayas believed that each day was a living God, and it had to have a certain number of sacrifices in order for it to um, survive. So um, using um, the, their complex mathematics, all of their buildings, the Mayan temples, um, are with what da Vinci called the golden ratio, or the never-ending ratio that is used in Renaissance perspective painting. It is, um, the Parthenon uses it, the pyramids of Egypt build it, and the Mayan pyramids um, build it. They were able to use it also, not only to build their buildings, but to um, come up with an extremely accurate calendar that is an almost identical to ours. They had 365 and a quarter days, and we have 600 and 665 and a half days each year. So, we know about the uh, calendar. Um, here is their writing system. It has 800 or so glyphs. We're not really sure what they all mean. Several years ago, some grave robbers uncovered part of the Rosetta Stone, and we're working on translating it as we speak. So Mesoamerica, we have to understand much of what we know comes from a very definite Spanish bias. Much of what we know comes from outsiders, so you always have to keep that in, in mind. This is going to bring us next to the Aztec civilization, all right? And we are going to, on this video, kick some Aztec, world history joke number two. And the Aztecs will come to power between 12 and 1400, from the heart of the Crusades um, to the Renaissance and Prince Henry's um, navigation, simultaneous with the great Zimbabwe down there in Africa. And the Aztecs are going to enter as nomadic warriors into the Valley of Mexico. And they're going to be the warrior arm of another civilization known as the Toltecs. And after a while, the Aztecs say, why are we doing all the fighting? Why don't we take over? And they do, and they form a civilization that is a cross between ancient Sparta and ancient Rome. The Aztecs did not have a standing army because every single male was expected to be in the army. Everybody did mandatory military service. The nobles were sent to officer candidate school or to West Point, Annapolis, and Colorado Springs, and the peasants went off to boot camp to be frontline soldiers. An Aztec culture 
surrendered around expanding their empire like Rome and capturing prisoners of war. Prisoners of war were needed to be sacrificed. And so, uh, much like ancient Rome, as the Aztecs expanded, they became an extractive economy. They <laughs> slurped out the resources like slurping the bottom of a milkshake with, with a straw, much like ancient Rome did. And they required a heavy tribute from their people. 7,000 tons of maize, 2 million cotton cloaks. They left you just enough to survive. And what they would do as they expanded their empire was they were very selective on what villages they hit. It had to have a big enough male population for their warriors to distinguish themselves in battle. You didn't want to kill your opponent. You wanted to wound them and bring them back so they could then be sacrificed. And here is where they build the great city of Tenochtitlan, sitting in the middle of Lake Texacoco, um, the four causeways running to it, the four big um, bridges. If they were in danger, they could knock those bridges out, and you would have to cross the water to get to them. The canals link the different parts of the city, much like Venice, the Aztecs formed their floating reed baskets known as chanampas. They anchored them to the ground and they had floating gardens. The market of the city was so big, 60,000 people went there and shopped each day. It was like going to a giant Sam's Club or a Costco. It just blew Cortez away. He's like, look at this giant, magnificent floating city. They've got tribute coming in. This is as big as Sevilla or um, Cadiz. Um, it's the greatest thing ever. It's coated in gold. So why don't we go and um, destroy it? The Aztec religion was polytheistic, and it was based on sacrifice. The sun need to, needed to fight against his evil brother, Night, kind of like um, Set and Osiris in ancient Egypt. Sacrificial victims powered the sun and would save the world. And so um, it's believed um, right around 1450 that the Aztecs sacrificed between 20 and 30,000 people in one day. And they would attack a village, take most of its young men, its warriors, let's say 18 and older, and sacrifice them. Leave young boys and teenagers and they would come back 10 or 12 years later and do the same thing, taking off the older men to sacrifice, leaving enough young men to rebuild the population so their warriors had something to do. And using an obsidian knife, they were able to rip the heart out of a sacrificial victim very quickly between 15 and 30 seconds. The Aztecs ran their government, like I said, very authoritarian, the very militaristic, like ancient Sparta. Um, there was a chain of command, general, colonel, captain, major, or excuse me, general, colonel, major, captain, first lieutenant, second lieutenant. Um, this is the way it went, and there were only two social classes, nobles and commoners. Um, nobles were the hierarchy, commoners did all of the work. There was a very small, tiny merchant class um, that exported Aztec culture and brought them intelligence on where there was villages to attack. Everything in the society-like chain of command was color-coded. Um, you wore an elaborate color, a bright yellow, a bright green. The more flamboyant your color, the higher your rank in society was. However, it's the Spider-Man philosophy. Um, the greater your power as a noble, the, be the better your behavior had to be. Standards were higher for nobles than they were for the commoners because the nobles were supposed to know better. And the Aztec neighborhoods were divided into things known as capuli. And I say, think of it as um, New York City neighborhoods at the height of immigration. 
Um, there is the Irish neighborhood, the Polish neighborhood, the Jewish neighborhood, the Italian neighborhood, and you um, went to church and you went to school or you went to synagogue in your own tiny little neighborhood. Everything revolved around it, like your neighborhoods around here with your um, home, home ownership, the HOA. The Capuli paid its own taxes. It kept up its own maintenance. It made sure things were clean, made sure people were um, practicing their military skills, that the boys and girls were getting educated. Everything was done, your neighborhood, as it fit into the empire as a whole. In Aztec society, women had very um, high status. They could own their own businesses. They could speak in court. But they were expected to do domestic duties, except if you had a lot of um, children. The more children you had, the higher your status rose because you were bringing warriors for the empire, just like ancient Sparta. And the Aztecs reached the height or the zenith of their power barely 100 years before Hernando Cortes and the conquistadors show up and dominate the Aztec civilization in 1519. So that's the end of the great Mesoamerican empires. We're going to shift now down here to South America. All right, Ecuador, Chile, Peru, running down the Andes Mountains. And just like with the Olmecs and the Kingdom of Ghana, the foundational empire in the Incan Empire was known as the Moc Moche and the Nazca um, people. Um, they will um, formulate and combine and mix together Chavin, you know, Moche, Nazca people, people, combining to form the ancient Incan Empire. The people of Nazca are famous for these giant shapes. You got like the big bird here, you got this giant crop circle monkey and crop circle um, spider. Um, and a lot of people, as a result, believe they were settled by aliens. I'm not quite buying it yet, but that's what some say. Much of the Incan Empire is located high up in the Andes Mountains. Very difficult terrain. It's 10, 11,000 feet. It has very thin air. You can see the beautiful lake Titicaca here, supposedly means pouncing leopard. And you see an Incan village high in the Andes Mountains in this valley. Um, so people had to find a way to maximize land resources in this area. Just around the same time that the Aztecs were getting going, the Incas under the great king Pachuti um, was on the throne. And he builds a powerful kingdom in the valley of Cusco, means land of four corners, kind of the only flat land at key intersections where he could build his magnificent um, empire. And Pachuti takes the throne, conquers his neighbors, and then kind of retires and sets up the great organization of the Incan Empire. By the time they're done, their empire will be 25, 2,500 miles long and include as many as 16 million people. And the Incas were very smart when conquering you. First, they would ask if you wanted to join in an alliance. Work with us, we're going to take care of you. If you said no, they would build a large warehouse, a Sam's Club, full of their food and clothes and tools and weapons. And they would hope that you would go in and either be amazed by it or intimidated by it. Man, we can't match that. We might as well work with these guys. And if you said no to that, then they would militarily take you over. And they were smart enough to know that if what you're doing is working and you acknowledge me as king, keep your local government, keep your local customs. We're just trying to find a way to get you to fit into our large empire. And so they're going to build an amazing series of roads, like carving steps in the hot, steamy jungle, or running along these narrow paths. I don't know if you can see there's a guy right here. I'm like, please, God, don't like him fall off. Um, the great Machu Picchu right here, you guys may know it from the emperor's um, new group. But anyway, the Aztec government 
had control over just about every aspect of your daily life. Um, you know, everything was rigidly controlled and all subjects, Incan and conquered, had to pay a tax to the Incas. And it is called the Mita system, which is very simply all able-bodied Incans have to work for the government, paying their taxes, maybe serving in the military, maybe, maybe building a road network, some type of public work project, maybe farming in the governmental fields or in the fields run by the temples. But you had to work roughly about 40 days a year. After that, you went back to your normal occupation. This is how the Incas ran highly organized, very tightly controlled their empire. When it's so big and so diverse, um, you got to find a way to keep it organized. They also built warehouses full of food and craft goods and weapons throughout the empire. So if you needed something, you weren't very far away from it. Um, their achievements are many. They built this extensive road system um, upwards of 14,000 miles. The rope suspension bridge to cross gorges or like rivers so you didn't have to climb down the mountain and then climb back up the other side. It, speeded, it sped up communication with their chaskis or their cross-country runners that ran, you know, five, ten miles from relay station to relay station delivering messages. They could cover the length of the roadway system in five days. So it sped trade, it sped communication, and it sped the uh, military. And like the mines, the Incas will practice terraced farming, cutting these flat fields into the mountainside so soil wouldn't wash away, soil and plant erosion. And if they did, they invented these giant toilet bowl things to capture everything so they didn't waste any of it. Another thing they did when a group rebelled, if you were a group that lived high in the mountains and you began to rebel, they would move you down to the bottom of the um, valley in the Amazon River Basin. And they would move a village from the river basin up to the mountains. Because it's high altitude, you would spend so much time adjusting to your new environment, going from the, the you know, hot, humid, sea level jungle to a 10, 11,000 foot village, you would spend all of your time trying to survive so you could not um, rebel. One of the things that's unfortunate is the Incas never did develop a writing system. Instead, they used a quipu, a large strand that had a different series of knots or beads on it, kind of like an ancient abacus, and it helped us understand um, or helped them understand data, tax records, population records, travel time. So like a green bead followed by uh, yellow and a blue, a second yellow and a blue, a third yellow and a blue to another green one meant we think that the Incas left land, they traveled for three days, the three yellow beads are the sun, over water, the blue beads, until they got to land again. We think so, but we're not super sure. The main god of the Aztecs was um, Intai, who was the sun and was represented in the king of the Incas known as um, the Sapa Inca, who was so powerful he never wore the same set of clothes more than once. Just like in Mesoamerica, um, they practiced food and human sacrifices to Intai. One of the interesting things about the Incas is that they did believe in mummification Dead Incan rulers were among the holiest of objects. They would be mummified. They would have servants that would bring them food and water. They would actually take them to visit other skeletons, and they would take them out on parades as if they were living things. Kind of like, you know, weird. Um, we're not really sure. This is the great city of Machu Picchu. You can see the terrace agriculture and how it was built. Again, pure human labor way up here high in the Andes Mountains. And here are the two brothers 
Now, if Lupa and Huscar, who are in the Civil War when the Spanish show up, just like the um, Aztecs, just as they're at the height of their power, in come the Spanish, and the empire will quickly fall to Francisco Pizarro. Um, um, Aflupa offered to fill a room with gold and silver in exchange for his release. Um, Pizarro was getting terrified with all the fires and all the Incan warriors were coming. And as Aflupa goes out and says, it's okay, and he waves and the, and the warriors disperse, um, he is killed and the Spanish will um, take over. So guys, that's as fast as I can do Mesoamerica. I hope that's a good enough review for your quiz and essays. If you have any questions, feel free to please let me know. Oh, it's a, oh it is longer than yesterday. Sorry about that.